Hey everybody, welcome to the Caught by Happy podcast. Here we are, episode 13. I did it, I did it, I, I beat my goal. My goal was 12 episodes and now I'm on episode 13. I don't know how many episodes I got left in me. I Hopefully like 20, maybe let's make the next goal 20. Can I do 20? I don't know, I said I was gonna do 12. I did 12, here I am on episode 13. Let's go for 20, I'm gonna go for 20. So welcome to episode 13, past the goal. I couldn't have done these 13 episodes if it wasn't for the equipment that I went out on a limb and just bought for the heck of it. I went and I and I did go to Amazon warehouse deals to find some of this stuff. I didn't want to spend top dollar on brand new equipment if I didn't even know if I was going to be able to knock out 12 episodes in the first place. But I looked and I found some open box items, you know, a couple of microphones, a little audio interface. I mean, I do need to upgrade. I'm at the point now where if I'm going to go for 20, I better upgrade. But Anyways, all that to say, I put a link in my show notes to a bunch of Amazon warehouse deals, open box items, that if you click that link and go and shop, I might earn a small commission so I can buy that new audio interface that I need. So check it out. There's no reason for you to spend full price on a camera if somebody got one, opened it up and said, oh, I don't want this and returned it. So they're just knocking off some money, you know, because somebody already opened the box. They didn't use the camera. It's not broken. It's everything's great. It's fine. No reason to spend more money if you don't have to. I'm all about saving money. Check the link in my show notes. Save yourself some cash. All right, today I'm having a conversation with Colleen. Colleen Losh. Now, she was a very, very special friend to me and my wife when we first met. In fact, I wouldn't even know my wife if it wasn't for Colleen. Colleen introduced us. She grabbed a phone, stuck it to my ear, and on the other end was this wonderful, lovely woman that I eventually met and fell in love with and got married to. And then we had kids and uh, bought some houses, and here we are. But if Colleen didn't set up that initial meeting, and if she wasn't just harping on us to meet each other, then uh, who knows where I'd be. I, I don't think I'd be in Virginia. If I didn't meet my wife, I don't know if I would have stayed here long term. But this is where I am now. This is my home. So I am eternally grateful to her for that. She has three wonderful children who are just, uh, you know, in my mind, babies. They will always be babies to me, especially because Colleen moved away a few years back. You know how that is when you know young children and then they move away and you don't see them for a very long time. And the next time you see them, they're grownups and you're like, no, sorry, you're still a baby. Uh, it's it's just mind boggling to me, and I think about the passage of time and my own children and how quickly they're growing up. It was good to catch up with Colleen. We talked a lot about her interest in gymnastics. She was an Olympic level gymnast. I I guess you could say that. I mean, she had the opportunity to go train with uh, Bella Caroli, the Olympic coach. I mean, she didn't actually get the opportunity to do it, but you'll hear about that. Instead, she ended up going to Virginia Tech. She studied communications and psychology. She was a cheerleader, always been fit and active. And eventually we get to the point where we talk about how she started her business. It's called Core 57. She's a personal trainer down in the suburbs of Atlanta. She's a very driven person. And turning a hobby into a business is something that I think a lot of us, a lot of people who are listening to this, have a goal of doing. Like they, There's something that they really enjoy doing. They love doing it. Maybe they're not doing it to make money right now or they're not making money at it, but there's potential there. And there's a real passion and a potential to take this hobby and turn it into like a full-time grind and a hustle. And Colleen did that. She worked her butt off to learn everything she could about the science behind fitness, to become a certified trainer, to become trigger point certified, all these things that she was talking about that I have no idea what she's talking about because obviously I'm not that guy. But <laughs> she is that guy. <laughs> And she's really good at it. And she's super driven. As a personal friend of hers, I'm so proud of her for doing it, building it, and then taking it and running with it and making a real thriving business out of it where she is now opening up a second location or she did open up a second location. Hey, maybe you have a story that's similar to Colleen's. And if you want to share that with the audience, please email me at copyhappy at gmail.com and I'll get you on here. I got to get to 20 episodes. So come on the podcast and we'll talk about it. But for now, we're going to talk to Colleen. Just a heads up, we had to do this over Skype. My internet was being a little funky that day. There's some weird noises happening in the background, so I do apologize for that. 
But if you can look past all that mess, I think you can really pull out some nuggets of wisdom from my friend Colleen. So let's just jump into it. Let's talk to her. Here we go. Here's my conversation with Colleen Losh. How are you, my friend? How are you, handsome? <laughs> I haven't seen you in forever. I mean, I know you've been here a few years in a row, but I haven't been able to it's see you guys. How are the babies? Babies are good. Okay. So Colleen. Yes, sir. F- first of all, like I would not have children if it wasn't for you. <laughs> <laughs> I would not be where I am now. I probably wouldn't even live in Richmond. I don't even know where I'd be if I didn't meet you first. Well, I think you would have been done just fine, but <laughs> Jessica and creating a family, I think you did pretty well. So, yeah. So, like, let's can you tell me the story about I, I know the story, obviously, because it happened to me, but I want to hear it from you. Like, from your perspective, how did you setting up me and my wife happen? Oh, my gosh. I have. So first of all, you know that I adored you and you and I were very good friends and um, I adored Jessica and she was like my little sister, the little sister I never had. And knowing you and spending so much time with you in the mornings when we were doing, when you were the camera guy, director and all that, and I was just a little peon doing traffic reporting, you and I had a really tight connection and it was pretty awesome, our friendship. And so knowing Jessica and knowing that I wanted somebody for her that would adore her and love her as much as I did, you were, of course, my number one choice. So what I think is funny is Jessica had just, uh, she was just getting ready to turn 21. She was not looking for a relationship of any sort. You were not looking, you were like, are you crazy? Like, I don't, I don't know what you're doing. Why are you setting me up? I don't even know this girl. So getting the two of you just to talk on the phone was kind of crazy. And I remember going into, I think it was your office and calling Jessica on the phone and she answered. And then I was like, here, talk to Matt. That's um, exactly what happened. Yeah. <laughs> and I, and- and she was like, oh my goodness, really? I'm just, I think she had just gotten out of a relationship and had decided that she wanted to just kind of play the field a little bit. I think it was almost like a year that you were in my <laughs> year. It was a long time that you were like, you got to meet Jessica. You got to meet Jessica. And we both went back and forth and you might've been saying the same thing to her. We were forced into saying, well, I guess we should probably just meet us to get her off of our back. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Cause Colleen's driving us both crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So then I think you did meet and it was okay. Right. And you, I think you guys went out on a date and then what I, but I don't remember what happened after that. What I remember is when she turned 21, you yeah. showed up, I think with flowers and really romanced her. Sort of. I mean, I think we went out on a couple of dates and it was like, yeah. okay, well, she, you know, she's young. Then she turned 21, had a big party. And I think she got like a little tipsy and she called me that night. <laughs> well, that's not the story I got from her, but well, I'm sure. Yeah. Anyways, at, we at that point where she realized that she wanted to kind of figure out whether or not you were going to be part of her life. And yeah. then we went from there. Right. Yeah. I mean, God saying 21, it just sounds so damn young. Right? I mean, wow. <laughs> What was she thinking at 21? She had her whole life ahead of her. Yeah, but she was so, you know, she, Jessica, you know her, you love her, you're married to her. She's always been older than her years, right? She's a lot wiser and yeah. um, she's just a great person. And so I was very happy that the two of you listened to me and got married and then had three beautiful babies. Yeah. And speaking of babies, your babies were in our wedding. And they were. Yeah. yeah. All three so, of them. I mean, you've just been such a like big part of our lives, even though you're so far away now. <laughs> yeah, I know, but there are special people in your life that you don't have to see and talk to all the time that will always, this will always be part of your life. And that's what you guys are to me and certainly to my children. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So tell me about where you grew up. So I was born in the Poconos. My mom was a single mom. My dad left when I was very young, 18 months old. Um, mm-hmm. And my mom and I, very small house, very simple life. And then when I was seven, my mom remarried and then we moved to Virginia. And he adopted me when I was eight. We lived in Virginia wow. from first grade up into the middle of eighth grade is when we moved to New Hampshire. And so from the middle of eighth grade to college, I lived in New Hampshire, went to Virginia Tech. Parents still lived in New Hampshire. And then after I wow, left, I know, left New Hampshire, I, um, I met my first husband and moved to Richmond, Poconos, Pocono, PA, to Fairfax, Virginia, to Nashua, New Hampshire. To Virginia Tech, to Richmond, Virginia, and now I live in Georgia. Your biological dad, have you ever had contact with him since then? No. The last time I saw him was when I was three years old. Oh, wow. Any idea whatever happened to the guy? I do. Um, you know, it's kind of a crazy story. He wasn't, my mom 
has never really said a bad word about him, uh, but I did not have the best childhood with him. You know, he was not a nice man. He physically abused my mom. Um, there's, so there's a lot that came out as I got older that I didn't know until I was in my late thirties. Yeah. Yeah. I know uh, Bob. Yes. I mean, what a great guy. I mean, if anybody's going to step in and be the dad. Yeah. I always said that guy. I was really lucky because I got to choose my dad. Right. Not many little girls get to choose their dad. They're just kind of given their dads. You know, my mom, the moment my dad and my mom started dating, I was five. They got married when I was seven and he adopted me when I was eight. From the beginning, I just I fell in love with him and we just had an amazing bond at five years old. My mom at that point was still not convinced that she wanted to get remarried and she just loved having me. And so she would date a couple of men. And when my dad, who now is my dad, when Bob would come into town because he lived in Virginia, he would ask if we did anything over that month because we'd only see him once a month. And I was like, no, even though I knew my mom had gone on in a date, I didn't want my at five years old. I didn't want my dad to know that my mom and my mom was like, he already knows. But I just wanted him to be part of my life so badly that yeah. I wasn't willing to screw it up at five. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty that's a pretty special connection Yeah, to be to be so young and have that. So we were in Virginia. I mean, we were in Pennsylvania. We lived in Pennsylvania right around the corner from my grandparents. And when he proposed to my mom, my mom and I picked to Virginia to be with him. Wow. And the following year, they were married. Where did you end up going to high school? Elementary school and middle school in Virginia. And then we moved to New Hampshire for my high school years. But then you came back to Virginia to go to tech. I did, yes. What were you studying in tech? Psychology. But you were also a cheerleader, right? I was. I was a varsity I- cheerleader. Yeah, that's that's what I remember about our talks back in the day. Oh my gosh, I was so young then. You were a because you were a gymnast. I was a gymnast. I was a highly competitive gymnast, and then I retired from high school, and then went on to do cheer for fun because I still wanted to be active, but I didn't want the the constraints that gymnastics had. I wanted to have fun. I wanted to socialize. I wanted cheerleading. Gymnastics is so you have to be so dedicated. I think you used to tease me because there was like so many songs I didn't know, right? Because I was always in the gym. I never got to hear these songs. So I, when, I, when I realized I wasn't going to go towards the Olympics, that was my goal. I had gotten a scholarship to Penn State. Offer, you know, kind of like it was not a, a written offer, but Penn State was in, were interested. A gymnastics scholarship? Gymnastics. Mm-hmm. Wow. And so I was like, yeah, I don't think I can do this. That was my freshman year where Penn State was kind of the saying, hey, we're thinking about you. But I looked at my coach and said, I can't do this for another eight years. If I'm so not going to go to the Olympics, I don't want to just do it. So you were trying to go to the Olympics. Was. Mm-hmm. And what happened to let you know that you weren't going to make it there? Um, I had gotten an offer to go down to Texas to kind of interviewed by Bella Crowley and go through his program. But my parents didn't want me. My mom didn't want me to be in, live in Texas. I would have had to live with a host family and mm-hmm. move away from home and be raised by a different family. And my mom was like, heck no. So they kind of put the kibosh to that. And once the kibosh was done to that, I was like, gosh, that's all I really ever wanted. Was that tough? Did that cause a lot of fight? Uh, No, I think because of uh, the past with my my mom and myself and our journey, um, I never wanted to disappoint my mom. My mom had had a lot of heartache and a lot of hurt. Um, I was her one joy other than my, you know, her new husband. But it's still a lot of it fell on my shoulders. So I knew that leaving would, would hurt her. I just embraced that it wasn't going to be in the cards for me. She still hears about it to this day. I still say, yeah. oh, mom. Do you think you could have made it? Do you think you could have been on the Olympic team? You know, I don't know. I, I know that I have a heart for it. I, at 40, almost 47 now, I still tumble. I can still swing bars. I have a pretty natural ability for gymnastics. I don't know if I would have made it, but I would have liked the opportunity to try. Wow. Everybody laughs because they say, you know, what did you get from Santa? I got a trampoline. And here I am, almost 47 years old, and I got a great trampoline because I'm not ready to give it up yet. Awesome. All right. So you get to tech. You're studying psychology. You're a cheerleader. Tell me about that whole experience, those four years or however long you were there. So I was there for four years. My second semester of my senior year is when I kind of stopped cheering. Um, I had realized at that point that I needed to get a job and I needed to start looking towards the future and cheerleading wasn't going to be part of that future. And it was very time consuming. And I wanted to make sure I was prepared to graduate and have a job. Four years of, cheer, of you know going to Virginia Tech, I started off in interior design. And then and I couldn't decide whether I wanted to go into communications or psychology. And so I kind of interviewed the communications department and I interviewed the psychology department. And I really, really liked the professors at the psychology department better than the communications. Ironically enough, 
I didn't <laughs> get into psychology. I ended up going into communication. So it was still always a love of mine. I, you know, Virginia Tech didn't have the best. They're going to hate, hate me for saying this, but they didn't have the best communications program. They had a much stronger oh. psychology program. And I had got a really great education. I had fantastic professors. I learned a ton, but my heart was still open was in communications, which is why I you know, went to NBC 12 and tried to get a job there. Is that where you went pretty much right after pretty school? Much. Mm-hmm. I don't know why. I just felt, I know you're close in age to me, but like, I felt like you were so much like older and more experienced. And Well, I was married with children then, you know, and so I think, I think you are, right? It's, there's that time in your life when you're in your early twenties and your later twenties that, you know, you were, you were not married you didn't have kids we were I mean, how old are you now i'm i'm 47 almost 47 oh, yeah i'm 41 yeah are you that close to me yeah. yeah i think it's just the fact that i was married and i had two children how soon after college did you get married i got married when i was 24 well, yeah. you and jessica meeting these guys when you're so young <laughs> i know well hey look it worked out for jessica but it hasn't worked out for me so. <laughs> All right. So you're married, you've got a couple of kids and you're working at the NBC affiliate. Like, what were you doing there? What, how did you, what was your foot in the door there? My foot in the door. It's so funny. My foot in the door was Andrew McDaniel. So I did work at a gym in between kind of trying to figure out what I wanted to do. Uh, You know, I went back to fitness because it's what I felt most comfortable in. I didn't have a lot of direction from my parents for college. My dad was an awesome dad. He was math and science oriented. I was not. And so I I was kind of a little bit directionless. I was the first one from my mom's side to ever go to college. Um, I was the first female on my dad's side to ever go to college. So it was, I didn't have a lot of direction. I came from an Italian family, um, immigrants. And so going to college and then knowing what to do after that, I was a little bit directionless. So I didn't come out with the best job. What I knew was fitness. So I went back into fitness, knew I wanted to be in communications, met Andrew McDaniel and said, hey, can you tell me how you got in the door? She says, why don't you come out and see one of my morning shows? She was a morning anchor at the time. So I did. And she introduced me to Bonnie Talbert. And Bonnie Talbert was like our mom, right? And so Bonnie didn't have anything available. And I pretty much said to her, I will empty trash cans just to get in the door. And I think she saw my desire and my willingness to empty trash cans. And she says, well, we might have a positioning opening up. So I started as an editor. What? Really? What year was this? It had to be 19, I got married in 1990, it had to be 1997. I just gotten married. Oh, so I wasn't even there yet. You weren't there yet, no. Okay. So I started as a peon editing for Bonnie, weekend hours, crap hours. She just kind of put me in where she needed me. I think I was filling in. I don't think I was yet on the evening shift for, shift for editing, but I was filling in for Frank Jones, who was our executive producer. And Frank is crazy. Frank is, you know, high strung and he likes things to perfection. And I was able to edit for him and handle his stress. Then I ended up moving up and got better hours. I think because I worked so well, he may feel differently. He may not even remember me, but I remember us working well together and being able to handle the quickness of, of his producing. You know, he had a lot on, he was the executive producer. So we had a lot going on and we were the five o'clock show. So if we had breaking news at 455, he knew that I was going to get whatever he needed done and ready for him to go. Yeah. And then he kind of grew me from there. He, he was the one that asked me to do the traffic reporting. And then I got the job with, you know, 12 on your side and kind of the investigative producing and all that. Yeah. Frank's come up on this podcast a couple of times already, just from the Frank Jones family tree, because everybody's got this connection. Somehow they've all worked for or worked in the same building as Frank at some point. Yeah. <laughs> and, and listen, he grew us. Like, you know, he was, he could be brutally honest. In, in yep. a good way. And you know, what I love about Frank is he, he wanted us all to grow and he wanted us all to do what we were good at. And so he helped us find our strengths. You know, sometimes our weaknesses, he was quick to say, nope, you're not going to be able to do that, but here's what you're going to do. And he did that with me. Um, on air wasn't really my talent. Um, I also was having, I had two babies at the time and I was sleep deprived. So he moved me into a different part of the business and I really loved it. And I grew in that field better than I did on air. So did he put you into the producing role? You were doing like field producing, like special projects? He did. He, in special projects, he recommended me for that. Did you really like it? I did. I loved it. And it was the right call for me. And and also what it allowed me to do is I had a lot of flexibility with raising my kids. Special projects wasn't, I didn't have to turn a story every single day. You know, we got to work on stories. We got to dig in a little bit deeper, do a little bit more research. And I find that to be a lot of fun. What happened with the traffic stuff? Because when I was there, you were kind of filling in and practicing I I a little bit. 
I think Frank was trying to see whether or not I had talent for on air and, and, and I didn't. Right. And I don't know if it was timing. Again, you had to get up really early in the morning. My brain was a little bit foggy and I had the babies at home and I was sleeping maybe three hours a night. And I don't think you can do anything well when you're only sleeping three hours a night. Yeah. And, you know, maybe if it was prior to my children, I'd like to think that I would be a little bit more successful, but it just wasn't the right time for me. And I didn't do a great job on it. And it's OK. <laughs> I remember helping you, like trying to help you along and like. I was so nervous, right? I was really nervous. Yeah, you were really nervous. When you want something so bad, which I wanted it so badly, I almost hung myself with it. Um, yeah. I wanted it that badly. And Frank just kept saying, relax, relax, relax. And I couldn't relax because it was my dream to be on air. And I was overthinking everything. When did you realize, like, all right, I'm I'm going to stop doing this now? I think when Frank told me, you're done. <laughs> <laughs> did it crush you? It did, because I don't like to fail. Yeah. I, you know, I'm, I've am i always been one that I'm coachable. And it, it did crush me. It was probably the first thing in my life that I wanted so badly that didn't work out that I didn't get. And then there was no opportunity to try again. That was what was so difficult about it. Well, because at that point, you had been working at the station for a while. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I had been there for about five years. And I'd always been able to work my way up into what, you know, I'll never forget when Frank came to me and said, we want to put you on air. I mean, that was my dream. So it was a little bit devastating. You know, I would love to do it. I would still love to go back into TV's capacity. But this time, I'd like to talk about fitness. Of course you would. Not really passionate about traffic. No, not really. And <laughs> what did you do after that then? So you were kind of there and then you were gone. So not long after that, I got pregnant with my third child, had Cadence, still did pre special projects. Cadence was born in February of 2005. So she was born in 2005. My husband was transferred to Atlanta in uh, March. She was born in February, March of 2005. And so we moved in March of 2006 to Atlanta. So what happened once you got down to Atlanta? So once I got down to Atlanta, I, um, I was a stay-at-home mom. I had had, um, through Channel 12, I had had some um, connections to go to CNN or the Weather Channel. Atlanta's kind of a, a crazy animal. Traffic here is really bad. I looked at where the weather station was. Bonnie had given me quite a bit of connections and contacts. And I had contacted a few of them. They said, when you get to Atlanta, we'll meet up. But Hayden was working a ton, and I had three babies and nobody to raise my babies. And I had decided at that point that maybe it was time for me just to stay home and raise them. So that's what I did. I took some time off of work. I stayed home. I raised the kids, loved every minute of it, um, and then got bored. Did they just reach an age where it's like, okay, I don't need to be staying home with you? I think I've always been active as well. I love being a mom, but I also love having an identity other than being a mom. And sure. I think for a little bit, I didn't have that. And it was just like, okay, well, they're in school now. What am I going to do? Now, Cadence wasn't in school. She was still young. But what am I going to do now? And I need something to do. A new gym had opened up in Alpharetta. It was called Lifetime Fitness. I thought, well, you know what? I'll go and get certified as a, as a personal trainer. I can put Cadence in daycare because I'm done shopping at Target. I don't play tennis. There's really nothing for me to do. So I went and I got certified. And I thought, well, man, this will be a great way for me to have a purpose of going to the gym. I, I love to be active. And I'm lucky that I've got a great physique. But I've, I don't look in the mirror and wonder whether I've gained five pounds or not. I don't know if that makes sense. So for me, being active was just because I love to move. It didn't have anything to do with the way that I look. So um, I kind of wanted to teach people about just moving better and being more active and kind of getting away from the visual part of fitness. Sure. When I got certified, I went, I was going to apply to Lifetime Fitness, but it was, uh, it was a hundred percent commission and it was cutthroat and it wasn't about making people better. It was about how many clients can you get and steal from other trainers. And I didn't want to be part of that. So I started a little business in my basement. Had you ever thought you were going to start a business before? Like what, what made you want to start your own business? Was it just the fact that you didn't like the model that Lifetime was offering and you thought you could do it better? I think so. I, I didn't like the, the model that Lifetime was offering. I also had a little one. So I wanted a little bit of flexibility because Cadence um, was still young. She wasn't even in preschool yet. And I wanted to have flexibility to be able to raise her, work around her nap schedule, kind of make my own hours. And I wanted, didn't want to be limited on their expectations. I, I knew that there was a need out there for people, women. At the time, I started training women who had some sort of an injury that wanted to work out and not go to physical therapy. So my niche was, how do I take somebody with a hurt knee and who's had five knee surgeries and still train them? And it was my neighbor across the street that made me realize that there was a need for that that didn't exist. Because she came to me and said, oh, I know you just got certified. 
I would love to work with you. Let me tell you my problems. And I was just a personal trainer at that time. And so she had had five knee surgeries and she was very limited in what she could do for her legs. So I said, oh my goodness, there's so much I don't know. So that sent me into getting my certification as a corrective exercise specialist. And then as a trigger point master trainer, because I wanted to help people that couldn't go to a gym. They still wanted to work out. They needed more physical therapy, but they still wanted to work out. So that became my sweet spot. And how long until your client list started getting to the point where it's like, uh, I can't do this in my basement anymore? At that point, I was still managing my clients. I was picky. I wasn't really actively going out to look for clients because it was just a hobby, honestly. One of my friends, Tracy, came to me and said, hey, our kids are going to be playing baseball and we're going to be out in the fields in the summer and we'd love for you to come and teach a boot camp. A boot camp was a new buzzword then. It was a cheaper way. The economy was kind of crashing at that point. Uh, mm-hmm. Personal training wasn't really affordable. So my rates for personal training were still affordable because I wasn't in it to make money at that point. So I was like, oh my goodness, I've never trained a group of people. I've only done one-on-one. I don't know if I'll be good at this. But I still had a different approach to it in my head. And I said, all right, let me try it. So I went out and I had 10 women that I trained all through the summer in a boot camp setting. And I trained these women and I found that I loved it. And it was great because the economy was turning where personal training was not going to be affordable to a lot of people. So I turned myself into being able to provide a boot camp at a different level than the average trainer. So did you just start doing that like outdoors, anywhere you can get a space or did you have like a... So not really. Um, In order, what I had found out is that as I was teaching that boot camp, I was kind of breaking the rules. I needed to go to the city and get an agreement with them to be able to do those classes. So I then I contacted the city. They said, you need to submit an RFP request for proposal. At that time, the city was a brand new city. The city of Milton was brand new. I did a whole request for proposal. I was the first non-city RECS program that they hired. So we had an agreement. We had a contract. I had to give them 20% of whatever I made. And I was the only trainer at that point that was allowed to use the parks. So it kind of it put me into a position where they promoted me. I promoted them. It was a win-win for both of us. Right. And it was where I was able to really grow my business. 20%, so, huh? They're taking that kind of cut? Yeah, they took 20%. But I didn't have to pay for space. I didn't have to pay for heat and yeah, for four the- walls. And, you know, they, they carried the liability. And it was a win for both of us. And at the time, they also were marketing me. So I didn't have to pay for marketing. Right. It was a great partnership. Um, and I loved them for that. And I don't know if I would be here if it wasn't for the city of Milton. So how long did it, did it take for that to really grow? How, how many people did you start with and how many did you see it grow to? So my very first session, it was 545 in the morning. I offered a free class to try to promote it. And I had one person show up. Her, her name was Lauren Jackson. And I'll never forget because it was just me and Lauren for 45 minutes <laughs> out underneath the light in the parking lot of this park. We weren't even allowed to use the grounds. We had to use the parking lot. So I did that for two years. It grew pretty quickly. Um, The name got out. Women were wanting to work out. I think it was a time where people were depressed. They were scared. Um, They couldn't afford to go shopping. They couldn't really afford to go do the things that they had desired to do. The price point was pretty low. It was affordable. And we grew pretty quickly. We went from like one to 10 per class in no time. What was the name of it? It was uh, Core Physique. Okay. So that's that's your name now. Yeah, well, kind of. We just were kind. in the process of rebranding. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so we were we were out in the parking lot in 20 degree weather. We were out in the parking lot in the rain. We were out in the parking lot in 100 degree weather. And we did that year round for 2 years. So it was it was a tough time. I mean, golly, I can't I can't believe some of my members that were my original mm-hmm. members are still with me now. And when it's 20 degrees outside and we're running through, you know, running from our car to the doors of Core Physique, we're all kind of laughing at ourselves. But <laughs> how did we handle it? You know, we were badasses then. Now we're wimps. <laughs> yeah. So you did that for two years. I did. Be- before you, what, got a, got your own place? So I did that for two years and my car was my gym. I had every piece of equipment in my car. Every morning I would get to the parking lot about 530 in the morning. I would set up. I would teach class from 5.45 to 6.30. I would run home, put the kids on the bus, come back, teach class from 7.30, 8.30, and 9.30, put the equipment back in the car, go home and do little things, get the kids off the bus, go back at night, teach a 6.30 class. So doing that for two years, my car, there's a lot of wear and tear on my car, on my equipment, you know, and, and again, the elements, you have to kind of dodge the elements and be able to work around that. And it got to the point where we were so successful 
then I almost had too many clients to be able to handle an outdoor boot camp of that capacity. With rent being so low and the economy being, being down, I was able to find a space. I could just take my existing client, move them indoors and not miss a beat and be profitable right away. And so that's what we decided to do. The people that you kind of started out with and were with you throughout these two years, did getting to know them at all, you know, hearing about whatever their motivation was for moving and getting in shape and staying fit, did it change your philosophy on how you were teaching people? Hmm, That's a great question. I don't think my philosophy has changed much. I think my philosophy is what brings people to me. Everybody has a story. And one of the things that I'm really good at is getting to know people. The science part of the personal training, that was hard for me. Learning science at an older age and having three kids and trying to work again and around being a mom and a wife, learning the science, because I really wanted to dig in deep. I wanted to learn how the human body moves. It was not just about a bicep curl or you know a dip or a skull crusher. It was there was so much more. I quickly learned there was so much science to fitness and we were missing that. We weren't educating people on that. So when Tracy had come to me to do that outdoor boot camp, I said, you know, I'm going to do a different approach. I'm going to have a binder and every week I'm going to give them homework and I'm going to educate them on their bodies and how we burn calories. And, you know, there's just so much I wanted to teach men and women about their bodies when they work out that they weren't being taught. And so my philosophy has always been education first, movement second. And I, I don't think my philosophy has changed. It's always been that way, but that's what sets me apart from the rest of the fitness population. I think that's what's made me so successful. And the fact, I think, I mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you said earlier, you're not the type of person who is looking to drop five pounds because you have a piece of your body that you don't like. You're doing it really to just to move and to be active and to stay fit. To live a longer life. We just, we don't, we always say to my clients, we get one body and we get multiple cars. Like we take better care of our cars then we do our own body. We can trade our car in when it starts to break down on us, right? We can get new wheels and tires and there's so many things we can do to our car. And we all take pride and most of America takes pride in their cars, but most of America does not take pride of their body, in their bodies. And we get one body, we get one life, one shot. And for me, I just want to teach people how to be able to capitalize on that and be able to move better and just be healthier. Mm-hmm. It's not about the way we look on the outside. It's about how long are we going to live and what are we going to be able to do when we're 70 years old? I don't want to stop moving. Right. Are you going to be an 80-year-old who's sickly and bedridden or are you going to be 80 who's spry and can move and a little active, you know? Yeah. And what we do today can affect tomorrow. Okay, so you get you get your you get your place. You got your your building. Like what, when you walk in, like, did you have an idea of how you're going to set this up? What was that like? Trying to figure out how you're going to decorate the place, how you're right. going to order a bunch of furniture and equipment and all that stuff you need. Yeah, the build out was crazy. It was, um, and that was before Pinterest. Right? <laughs> it was a lot of research and and going around and looking at gyms. I knew my philosophy. Fortunately, I'd been doing this outside for two years. So I kind of knew what elements I wanted to bring into the gym. The thing that I had gotten was ugly. So I had to pull out the carpet and it was ugly walls and it was awful. And and it's in a V. My my original location, Core, 50, core Physique, is in a V. So you walk in and it's kind of open in a V and the offices and the bathrooms are in the middle. So I also was kind of curious on how I was going to use that space. Um, it's almost divided into two, but the beginning is shared and then it goes out to a V. And, and we've done a really good job of creating and working around really good space. That was fun. It was daunting and, and nerve wracking, yeah. but it didn't take us long to figure out how to program design in there. And we just took what we were good at and then we were able to add to that, which was fun. Yeah. Did you feel comfortable doing that? I mean, I don't know if you, you know, I, I, I don't know if you've opened a business before. We... <laughs> Part of my personality is jump. And then think, I kind of jumped and I thought along the way and it just worked out. Uh, There wasn't a whole lot of planning. And remember, at the time, this was a hobby for me. Um, It was a way to simplify my life because it was getting to be, I was working so much. I had so much equipment. I didn't have any room for the kid's soccer bag anymore, the baseball bag. And so by putting my boot camp indoors initially was a way just to simplify my life, get my car back and not have to worry about the elements. So I wasn't, I, I wasn't looking to grow it to where it is today. The day the doors opened is when my husband and I split. So it me into a different, a different feel. Like all of a sudden this hobby was no longer a hobby. It was now going to be my survival. Holy yeah. cow. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. 
you opened your doors, like, did you, were you there like training people that day and everything? We had not really opened. Um, we were in the process of build, doing build out when Hayden left. And so, um, yeah, I mean, for a couple of days when the, when the doors had opened, nobody knew that we were separated. We were trying to figure out how to do that dance because I was scared. I was like, I can't do this without you. So I still wanted him to be part of it. And then, I mean, that was, that didn't last very long and we needed to not be in each other's presence anymore. Yeah. So. Did he help with the, with the coming up with the plans and the decorating and opening the place and all that stuff? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. And then all of a sudden it goes from, like you said, a hobby to, okay, now I need to make this work. Yeah. Yeah. I have three children. Oh. Yeah. And I need to make, I need to figure this out. Yeah. And there was a lot I didn't know. I was a great trainer. I was a really good trainer, but I wasn't a great business person. So I had to learn. I mean, I couldn't afford a computer. I couldn't afford a, side, a sign for the building. So for the first, I think, eight months, my building didn't have a sign. For the first year and a half, I didn't have a computer. So I was monitoring everybody's progress and all their payments on, you know, by hand. It was crazy. It was crazy. When, um, did you, yeah. when did you feel like, okay, I got this. I can do this myself. I don't know if I feel like that at all yet still. I still feel like, oh my goodness, this is crazy. This is daunting, right? I don't know the answer to that. I'm really, I'm probably my worst critic. So I still don't feel like I've got this. So this is easy. It's still so difficult. Uh, but I think, man, it was tough. It was a long year. Um, you know, going through a divorce, raising kids, growing a brand new business. I would say the first two years, I was just in survival mode. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and that's a little bit of a fog. And, you know, I lost a ton of weight. I was really skinny. I would have told you that everybody knew that I was getting divorced. And now people that know me will say, we had no idea. Right? I hit it well. I just did what I had to do. I just, I jumped right in and you just do what you have to do. Did you focus a lot on the business? Like just diving in to that? Yeah, or my kids in the business. So my, the way that my days worked on the weeks that I had the kids, I was in the gym at 530 in the morning. I taught a class, I'd run home, I'd wake them up, I'd feed them, I'd drive them to school, I'd come back and teach the 7.30 class, I would teach, and then I always made it so that I was home when they get off the bus. I would go home, make dinner, put saran wrap or tinfoil over their dinners, throw them in the oven. Briggs was in middle school at this point. Um, she'd pull the dinners out, I'd go back to teach. You know, and they didn't have evening sports back then, I don't think. I don't really remember how I was able to do it all. I just I just did. You just did it. Did it, Yeah. yeah. You're never going to remember. You're just going to look back on it and know that you did it. Yeah. Yeah. It just was, it was a crazy time in our lives. I mean, we yeah. just did it work. We just did what we had to do. Yeah. So I think that was about two years. Um, and the gym was doing great. The gym was growing. I was yeah. getting, I had at that time also um, gotten promoted to a trigger point senior master trainer. When I hit the industry, I had very clear goals for myself. And part of becoming a trainer, I had, I went to Virginia and I attended a fitness conference called IDEA PT Institute. And it was a conference for, for personal trainers in Washington, D.C. And it was three days long. I wanted to attend more of those. So what I did, I couldn't afford them. So I learned how to be uh, a worker for them. So I got to attend the conferences for free. So the next one, I get, they invited me out to Chicago. I applied. I was accepted into their program, which meant wow. I could work the conference. And I got to attend certain sessions for free. So I would work my sessions around the work schedule that they provided for me. And so I made friends with one of the guys, his name was Alex. Um, He was kind of my boss for that weekend. And he said, Hey, let's go grab a drink real quick. And I afterwards, because he said, you work really hard. And I, I love having you on my team. So we were sitting there and I was kind of asking him more questions because I wanted him to pick me for the next one. It was called Idea World. And that was in California. And that's the biggest, largest conference um, in the United States. And I knew I couldn't afford to do that. So I wanted to get on his good side. So that he would hire me to be part of his team in California. And so when we were there, there was a bunch of presenters to the right. And I said to him, someday I'm going to be a presenter. And he was like, okay, Colleen, whatever. Like, I'm just maybe a year into being a personal trainer. Through attending those conferences, he did pick me to go to California and work for him. I took a seminar called Trigger Point Performance. And Cassidy Phillips was the founder and the the trainer that day. And I became fascinated with it. And so when I bought a couple of kits, I came home, I practiced, and I kept contacting Cassidy. And I said, I want to be, you know, do you have master, do you have trainers? I want to be part of your team. I want to learn this because it's going to elevate me as a trainer. And he was not, my resume wasn't as big as other people. I didn't have exercise science. I didn't have all the sciences behind 
for him to pick me to be part of his initial team. So he did not. I attended another seminar a year later and Cassidy was there teaching. And I like, I pretty much, he'll tell you, I kind of stalked him. I stopped him and I said, Cassidy, I want to learn everything there is to know. And we, we started to talk and then he said, you know what, I'm getting ready to hire. Um, I'm getting ready to interview a next round of master trainers. Why don't you go ahead and apply? But no, no promises. So I applied and yet again, I was denied because the resumes were bigger. And I kept, I just kept staying present and asking him questions. So the next time that it came around, I was accepted into the program a third time. He, we all went out to Austin. We had four days of training out in Austin. And during those four days, he picked his top four trainers and I was one of them. Um, and so I got to do more because of my training. I made it that he was going to notice me. He's going to know that I was serious about this. And then a couple of years later, he picked, I think there was about 20 of us that were master trainers that became master trainers for Trader Point. Out of that 20, he picked six of us to be senior master trainers. And so from there, I got to travel the world. I went to Japan. I've gone to Germany. I've gone to almost every state in the country to, to host Trigger Point Workshop. Damn. So that elevated me to another level. Yeah. I mean, what a hustle, too. That's, I mean, only a few years of you, like, really. Oh, yeah. If they asked me, if they needed, I never turned them down. If they had a workshop, like, Colin, we've got a workshop in Oregon. Can you do it? I'd readjust the kids' schedules again, and I would fly to Oregon. Like, I never said no to them. Every time they put an offer in front of me, I accepted the offer. And that's just my work ethic. That's like, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this work. Um, I, there was one time I traveled like eight weekends in a row to present for Trigger Point. But it's also why I got to go to Germany. It's why I got to go to Japan. It's why, you know, I did years later when I had said to that, you know, Alex, I'm going to present on this stage someday. I did. I got to present at IDEA Personal Training Institute. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. That is what sets me apart from training. And that's why my businesses have been successful. And that's why I've been able to train Navy SEALs and NFL football players. And so many opportunities have come into my lap because of Trigger Point. And that really, for me, is what set me apart from everybody else. So where are you now? You, do you have a new you have a new building now? You mentioned you're rebranding. Yeah. So now we have our second location opened up a, a little over a year ago. Wow. Congratulations. We changed the name from Physique to 57 because I wanted to take what Physique did well and I wanted it to brand it. And so it's the five steps of success with the seven foundations of fitness. And so the five and the seven were clearly thought about. It's also, I am remarried. We have five kids and there's seven of us. So the number five and the number seven are very powerful numbers for me. They have a lot of meaning. And as I was, what I wanted when I opened up 57 was I wanted people to, I want them to work out, but I also want them to be healthy outside of my doors. And so it's the seven foundations that we really focus on. Um, I took them from what we were doing well at Physique, and I just wanted to brand them a little bit more. So foundation number one is fuel. Number two is hydration. Number three is movement. Number four is your heart health. Number five is pre and post recovery. Uh, number six is self life balance. And number seven is community. And our thoughts are that you have to have all seven of those foundations present in your life on a daily basis in order to be able to be successful. It's more than just coming in and working out at our, in our gym. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. All right. I know, we, I know you got to go, you got a client waiting, but you did mention you're, you're remarried and your stepchildren. And I, I just want to know, how did you meet this guy? Tell me about, tell me about all that. Oh my because God. Because we focused a little bit about the divorce and the separation in there, but I want to hear the happy stuff before we go. Yeah. So the happy stuff, I mean, my goodness, it's hard. Anybody that has been divorced and single, um, it's tough. It's it's not an easy road. There's a lot of judgment. Um, there's a lot of feeling of failure, right? So to do it, to get out there and do it again was, oh man, I said, I'm never going to do this again. I'm never going to get my heart broken again. And so I knew Jason, He, um, his son and my son are two days apart and they, we, I've known him for a long time. He was a friend of mine and he was somebody I trusted and our kids got along well. And so in a time when, you know, there's a whole lot of judgment out there, um, he was somebody I felt comfortable around. And I think we, I broke up with him. He'll tell you I broke up with him 101 times because I was so <laughs> afraid of all of it. But he was patient. We dated for about four years, not quite four years, like not seriously. And then we just get more serious. And then, uh, then we got married. We got married. We've been married for three years now. And I still haven't met the guy. I know. And he has two boys, Hogan and Hunter. Um, so we now, we, you know, our family, we have a 20 year old daughter, Briggs, that you know. Um, I can't believe she's 20. Oh my God. We have a 21 this year. So then now we have Hogan, who's uh, going to be 19. Maddox is two days younger than Hogan. He'll be 19. 
Hunter uh, will be 17 this year in a few months. And then Cadence, the youngest, your god, you know, you're Jessica's goddaughter, as she's uh she'll be 15 next month. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wow, that's crazy. So life uh, is good. Second chances do happen. It's a lot of hard work. You know, I think throughout this podcast like for me and I just like to work hard. I set my goals high and I go after it. You definitely do. You've always been like that. And I go well, along the way, right? Sometimes it's been survival. Yeah, for sure. But uh, you know, I wish you continued success. Mm-hmm. I really thank you for sitting down with me and taking the time. I know you're super busy today. Mm-hmm. And I'm not sure what people will get out of this other than it's my story. But you it's know. that's 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 all it is. It's your story and you built and you built a business. You did it. You're still growing. I am still growing. And and you asked me, you know, success, is it easy? And I had a girlfriend call me the other day and she said, you know, Colin, I was doing this thing and I had to write down somebody that I thought was so successful and so determined and just is making it. And she goes, and I picked you. And I was like, oh my goodness. I don't see my, uh, I don't see myself through those eyes. Well, you know what? I, I talked to a couple other people who have built businesses and they all say similar things to what you said earlier about hustling to the point where you're like trying to get on stage and be uh, a presenter. You know that you're pretty much going to be spending a ton of time doing this stuff and it's a sacrifice, but you're going to learn everything you can at the expense of your own sanity to get to the point where you need to be. Right. Exactly. You know, set your goals and go after them. A lot yeah. of hard, a lot of grit, a lot of sleepless nights. All right. Well, thanks for catching up with you. Yeah, it's good to talk to you too. That was pretty good, right? Hey, if you liked my conversation with Colleen, why don't you go to your podcast provider, wherever you're listening to this thing, see if you can leave a little rating or a review. Hey, I, I am open to any and all kind of feedback that you guys want to share with me or you can email me directly at caughtbyhappy at gmail.com and if you're interested in learning more about Colleen and her business Core 57 and you happen to be in the Alpharetta Georgia area why don't you go core57.com check it out pop in there take a class I don't know I wish I could give you a special code for like a free month membership but she didn't tell me I could do that but uh, if you pop in there just tell her I sent you I don't know how far that'll get you But if you do want to buy things that I recommend, I guess you could always look at my show notes because that's where I'm going to put the links to any products or anything that I'm actually repping right now uh, through affiliate links or whatever it might be. All right, everybody. I will see you next time on the podcast. Thanks for listening. Bye. Caught by Happy is a production of Harrington Communications Consultants. If you need any help with your social media, public relations, content marketing, any kind of digital communications whatsoever, we can help you. Hit us up at harringtoncc.net and we'll get you straight.